Welcome to our virtual press conference with Director of Athletics, Vince Tyre, and Associate AD, Matt Banker, to discuss our initiatives surrounding name, image, and likeness. Vince will make a few opening remarks and then pass it along to Matt, who will also make a few remarks. And after that, we'll open it up for questions to you guys. If you have a question, just put it in the chat, and I'll call on you uh, to ask your questions uh, of Vince or Matt. So, Vince, go ahead. Rocco, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, we had a little bit of a snag there for a second. It may be, may be me here, but anyways, uh, appreciate everybody coming on today. Um, you know, we had this press conference plan, just really, you know, kind of update on name, image, and like this. We knew we had uh, had a number of things in, in motion internally, but really just to educate and so forth. And then obviously we had some activity uh, that occurred yesterday that most followed. So. You know, the old saying, if it weren't for deadlines, nothing would ever get done, uh, certainly applies here. I think the, you know, the inherent deadline of July 1st, you know, it's been pretty motivating. I think at the federal level, been a number of hearings and things going on. Certainly at the NCAA, there's been plenty written about their thoughts or actions or interactions. Um, and then more recently here in the state of Kentucky, which, you know, we didn't have a, we had a bill drawn up, but not one really in play for July 1st. And I think we've kind of settled on that that may not happen um, at all in the state of Kentucky. But, you know, we're certainly appreciative of Governor Bashir's action um, this week, you know, coming up with a notion of an executive order, looking for support, looking for collaboration. Um, you know, we certainly were participative in that and, uh, and excited to where we got to yesterday. So um, I know that, you uh, I can oh, speak for the other universities, and they feel the same. Matt. Certainly, a lot of uh, conversation with Mitch Barnhart and so forth, and uh, the University of Kentucky. But you know, we're we're appreciative of it. I think you know we've been in, as I say, that constant contact with the others, and um, you know, Mitch and I've spoken quite a bit. You know, this goes back months, and certainly more this week. Uh, I think we have very similar ideals and interests related to the NIL, you know, name, image, like name, image, and likeness on behalf of our student athletes, and. Uh, how that should be administered. And then really it's up to the individual institutions on how they uh, execute the plan. So that that's on our own from there, um, which we've been doing for some time and Matt will speak to some details on that. But um, with the executive order on, in Kentucky, it does level the playing field. I think it's something our student athletes and frankly, prospective student athletes on recruiting visits are inquiring about. You know, they're pretty in tune with what's happening uh, opportunities. Uh, they talk to each other across schools uh, on visits and so forth. So I think that, um, you know, they were, re they're ready to go. And I think that um, you can probably see from some of the reaction that, uh, you know, they probably have their own initiatives um, to execute on it. <clears throat> so for us uh, as an athletic department, I mean, now, now comes the hard work, right? Now we got to execute on the opportunity because we have a number of constituents that we must keep in mind. And Certainly the student athletes and the you know current and prospective student athletes are first and foremost. Um, we've got initiatives in the law school with the clinic, um, this, the sports administration uh, program at the university, uh, marketing, we've talked about using the open doors technology to assist. Uh, there's a number of things that we have been doing and, and Matt's done a, a great job educating our coaching staff um, and the student athletes on what you know, kind of the do's and don'ts that, as we knew it at the time. And then, you know, obviously we've got to deal with the donors, our boosters, and a lot of education there so that they better understand it. It's, it's unfortunate that we only have a week, you know, if you will, to get to some of these hot topics, but um, I feel like we will do that. And, um, and as I said before, this is going to be trial and error. There's going to be um, things that occur, we're going to read about things, maybe mistakes and some opportunities that occur. You're, there'll probably be some eye popping headlines about a student athlete at school making a, a six figure deal or something. There, there could be a variety of things that happen out of the box. Um, you know, but we'll, uh, we'll wait and see. We're more focused on what we could do here at, uh, at the University of Louisville. But we also feel the opportunities availed by being located in a metropolitan city like Louisville without the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and uh, NHL, you know, looming over us really does provide a great opportunity for our student athletes to excel in the market. I think time will tell, but you'd have to believe the prospects of having, you know, a larger community 
Um, certainly uh, companies, corporate sponsors out there that would have interest and without the interference of some of the you know, major league uh, level uh, pro, you know, professional programs that um, they could they could be a better focus here, but we'll see. Uh, it's certainly our own personal opinion, but you know, with respect to some kind of high level thoughts, you know, I'll touch on some of those. And as mentioned, I'll turn over to Matt. He can get into plenty of detail or clarify any of my points. Um, you know, but I guess the biggest thing is, you know, we're we are excited for them to move forward. We've been a proponent. I've been outspoken, and I think it's the right path to go down. I think with guardrails. I think those guardrails are being put in place. We've learned a lot about what that might mean. Um, but I certainly, uh, being a former student athlete, um, have empathy for where they are in the situation. And, um, you know, hopefully they're uh, they're able to take advantage of it and do it within the guidelines that are presented. So they can have professional representation to help them, which I think is going to be important. I don't think many student athletes, nor would I have been <clears throat> in my playing days, had known what to do with a legal contract or had ever seen one. So um, I think that's having some representation um, is going to be important to help them. We're certainly going to help them on the, the uh, financial side and give them guidance and advice related to that, whether it be tax or whatever it might be they want to discuss. We'll certainly have plenty of people to, uh, to assist in that area. Um, but we're, we're happy to see them take advantage and make, make money. Um, the one thing we do want to see, though, is adhering to disclosure requirements. We do want to see them have the ability to make money, but we want to disclose what that is. They certainly don't need to inadvertently cross the line and, and do something they shouldn't be doing with an individual um, and, and the way they set up their own deal. So I think disclosure is going to be key. Uh, I think that's where they'll probably be, is my guess. I think there'll be some slippage and, and uh, learning curves here, but making sure that the student athlete, as they get something in place, discloses it. Um, you know, we'll have to have those, all those individual deals, you know, logged. And I think that over time, we'll learn what, quote unquote, the real fair market value is for some of these opportunities and in some markets, because the fair market value can't be assessed by just the city of Louisville. It may be, um, you may have a Henry Davis from up the Northeast who may, somebody up there may want to do something with him in his, his city. The value of that uh, in the Northeast may be different than what it is in Louisville, Kentucky. So I think that's, you know, certainly key that we kind of track and see and get a sense for it, but there's no black and white on that one today. Um, educational programs, um, you know, we're, we're going to make some requirements to get them in workshops, uh, teach them about, you know, financial aid, teach them about debt management, teach them about a variety of things. Uh, what all these things mean uh, in their life and when they start to have, um, for those who are able to accomplish it, have some some excess uh, conversation around. How do they handle it? What do they do with it that they've never had before? So we're not going to take for granted that, um, you know, where they came from has already provided them that education. Um, you know, I think the other thing is just where we feel like there's going to be, you know, the NCAA coming this week. Surely there'll be some kind of um, guidance or permissive policy that comes about temporary. You've heard that word that comes out of the uh, the NCAA this week. I think that'll, you know, just overlay what we're what we've done here and what's going on in this executive order. So we'll see what they have in place for us. It's certainly not going to be the full blown NIL that I think uh, the NCAA in, originally envisioned by July 1st, but it feels like there'll be something, you know, temporary in place to to also level the playing field across some of the states that that don't have an NIL bill in place. And that's where I feel like the, the deadline, if you will, that I referenced really was coming into play to get something uh, more in balance uh, across the states, across the universities than what we were gonna be coming up against uh, had they not start talking that way or had Governor Bashir not stepped forward and said, let's get this done. So um, with that, Matt, maybe you wanna step in, cover a couple of the educational things and some other topics would be great. Sure. Thanks, Vince, and, and good afternoon, everyone. You know, one, one thing that Vince alluded to that maybe I can add to is just the, the focal point of helping educate and inform our athletes to make informed decisions. If people say, you know, what, what are institutions thinking about, even though life skills and that sort of supplemental training and educational opportunities has always been something we've prioritized 
it's getting amplified even more. And, and one of those dynamics is to make sure it's not just one place that they're getting good information from. So we were thoughtful about partnering with, with different people and units on campus, the law school, the sport administration program, uh, the business school, um, and, and we do have people on campus uh, naturally that are subject matter experts and, and, and things like that. In addition, you know, finding partners out there that can deliver, you know, content in a way that's sort of accessible and digestible for college students, including student athletes. So those, those are some of the priorities, you know, even though there's been a lot of activity here in the Commonwealth this past week that, that Vince has mentioned, this is something we've been working on for quite a while in terms of where and what do we need to uh, position ourselves to support student athletes in this way. And then of course, the other piece is the actual policies and rules of the game are still maturing. We're trying to figure out what the NCAA might arrive at with their proposals or a temporary solution, whether there's a federal solution that will in essence uh, usurp everything else and become the, the rules of the game. So we have to be able to be a little bit nimble with some of those expectations at a fundamental level you know we're sharing with our student athletes the disclosure piece is really key and that at the end of the day an nil transaction needs to have you know them delivering on an endorsement an appearance whatever that might be in exchange for compensation when a marketplace hasn't been established just yet in terms of fair market value um and also you know just general life skills, uh, understanding who you're dealing with, uh, make, making informed decisions, being careful about who you affiliate with, sharing information, things like that. We understand as many good uh, companies and opportunities that may be out there, you have to be careful about who you're affiliating and partnering with. So some of that sort of, again, general shrewdness about business transactions, it's going to be a growth opportunity you know, for, for the student athletes and other students on campus too. Some of our resources, and I'll just kind of go quickly go through those, are available to to all of our students. For example, the, the SPAD class that we have specific to NIL and college athletics, as, as well as our law clinic that we're collaborating with between the law school and the business school um, as a couple of examples. Um, but we really took this as a comprehensive support that's you know, the role that certainly the NCAA has carved out to say institutions certainly should be filling the role of guidance, education, and, and so on. Um, and then also educating our coaches and staff about how and where and what can be shared and, and sort of highlighted through the recruiting process is also something, you know, we continue to have conversations on and the NCAA will have to continue uh, educating the membership on how and what can be done permissibly. Um, so we're excited about this. It's going to continue to evolve um, from everyone's standpoint. Um, you know, our priorities are student athlete well-being. This is a well-being issue, both in terms of opportunity um, and other things too. And, and we're mindful of that when it comes to NIL opportunities. Maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, and I would, one thing to say, Rocco, before you turn it over to questions, you're probably getting some. Um, if there are questions about the Austin case, we're happy to you know, I can touch on that. Matt certainly can, too. Uh, we've been following that very closely. And uh, as most know, I've been on the ACC uh, Austin subcommittee to follow this thing from start to finish. So um, interesting times. All right, Rocco. Our first questions for Eric Crawford and then Cameron. Uh, <clears throat> just on uh, one of the more interesting segments of this, and it's not just a law in Kentucky, it's in a lot of these, as we see written um you know athletes cannot necessarily sign contracts or get compensation from groups that the university deems are in conflict with contracts that you already have that to me not just for you but for everybody is going to be uh you know a complicated issue how do you envision handling that uh case by case or just general that you Clearly, a player can't get money from Nike if you're an Adidas school and and even down to smaller things like car dealerships. How does that get handled? How do you view that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll say on a high level on that, uh, Eric, I mean, I think one is to make sure that those companies first uh, don't cross ways with the values of the university either, whether it be drug, alcohol, bread, whatever, you know, whatever it might be, a topic gambling. It might be something to just make sure that 
they're in line with the university values. Um, I think the other thing is, as you do look at these, um, you know, companies that may want to do a sponsorship, that part Matt referenced earlier, it's still fluid. I mean, I still, I can't tell you right now that whether I feel comfortable as to whether that car dealership may or may not be able to do what they want to do until I see what finally comes out of this, um, you know, the NCAA guidelines, because that has been one that's been tossed around because smaller division one schools don't have the breadth of corporate sponsors that a that a, a bigger city would. So I don't think there was as much uh, momentum as excitement to adopt something like that. They would, you know, they saw it as an opportunity to, you know, where the differences may be from a power five to another division one would be let them let the car dealership uh, do something with them. Let them use the university marks and license. Uh, that's that's not the case at the higher level where there's some incredible value around marks and licenses like at University of Louisville, but specifically to the companies, um, you know, and boosters and how that works out, that has been one where on more of an individual basis, if, if you personally own that dealership, we don't want you to do something personally with uh, the student athletes, but there, there's a an interesting uh, gap there where maybe the, the company can. And uh, Matt, you may want to dig in a little d deeper. We've talked about this quite a bit. Yeah, you know, when it comes to booster involvement, e even the NSA proposed rules that, you know, a lot of institutions are certainly kind of in states like ours that really didn't have an action until this week as is using as the North, North Star is that, you know, boosters would be able to transact as long as the institution wasn't involved in brokering the deal. And Eric, I think also to your question, I, I, I think we're going to have to be looking at, which we are, our contract contractual obligations with the partners we do have and sort of where those boundaries are set um, in terms of, you know, and you see references to team rules or athletic department wide rules. I think those are going to have to work hand in hand to figure out where the limits would be placed. Um, but also at, at the end of the day, if there's again an NCA or, or federal law put in place, what that says as it relates to um, restrictions or, or conflicts of interest that may be presented with NIL opportunities for a student athlete. And I think that, you know, not to belabor the, the, the answer here, Eric, because it is a complicated one. At times, depending on what you hear from different sides of the aisle is how liberal that uh, definition would be. Um, you know, I think that's part of the negotiation should it come, should there be federal legislation that comes in and preempts what we're seeing today at the state level. Um, I think that's that's a topic that's getting has gotten heavy discussion back and forth. Cam. Yeah, yeah, Vince, you mentioned it. Sorry, um, you, you mentioned it a little bit when you were first talking, but you mentioned disclosure for the athletes. Um, I just want to clarify that. Is that something where um, the athletes will have to disclose um, contracts to you all before they can go through with them, or um, is that somewhere they just it needs to be disclosed afterwards, or kind of before they post anything or anything like that? No, and, how, and kind of how do you police that? Is kind of maybe my question. Well, I don't know if you met Officer Banker earlier on the call. That I was speaking earlier, but um, no, I think that you know we want to see those beforehand, particularly out of the box. I think that Matt would tell you that if you listen to some of the words he made. Uh, there that we want to make sure they completed the activity as well. I mean, just, just because they say they're making a, they signed a contract for a few hundred bucks to make an appearance at an event, a wedding or whatever it may be, uh, we want to make sure that not only did they sign a proper contract, but they completed the service that they signed up for in that contract. And that's, that. there's going to be nuance and to your word, policing of that. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a bit of a challenge. I think it's, uh, out of the box, just getting them into a new process uh, to do that is where all this education is coming from as as Matt and others are going team to team to meet with all these student athletes and educate them. Sam, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, two part question, Vince. Uh, given that uh, fair market value uh, is likely to be fairly high in some instances, You've uh, alluded to the possibility of six-figure deals. I I'm wondering if uh, your expectation then is that, uh, particularly for high-profile basketball players, uh, that this market is is going to be uh, six figures, maybe right out of the box. And 
uh, kind of as a corollary to that, uh, given what has been alleged in the in the Bowen case, uh, would that still be a violation? Uh, what indeed is is alleged to have done there, and uh, could that have any bearing on your case going forward? Yeah, I don't think that they would take today's NIL and have a look back on our case. You know, just starting with the six figure. I mean, there's already, um, you know, Matt would say it too. A little bit of rumors out there already about six figure deals in waiting, and uh, that we've heard of. So, do I think it's possible that um, that I pull into one of the sports complex in my F-150 and park next to somebody's Mercedes? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know that I think that could happen. So I think that. Um, you know, it's it's going to happen. Do I think it that you know that the difference with certainly there are differences in the in the Bowen case, and I can't speak too much to that because of the obvious uh, NCAA investigation. But there are there are natural differences had that been done um, in today's time and above board and and so forth. Can sign an eight, could use an agent now, can negotiate a deal uh, to do a contract. Um, I don't know that the my speculation is I don't know if the activity of the past would have been necessary um, should these the NL would have been in place. As a follow up, do you see this as just in many cases just bringing the black market above board? It feels like it. Um, you know, it does. I mean, that's a it's it's kind of a harsh way to put it in some way, Tim. But but unfortunately, I think it's true <clears throat> because whatever may have been going on. Uh, you know, we always joke about the hundred dollar handshake. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's worth the risk anymore to have a hundred dollar handshake if there were such one. It seemed like it'd be appropriate just to say, come over to the house for my kid's birthday party and sign this piece of paper and I'll have, I'll reimburse you. You know, that that's taking the black market above the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question to Andrew Chernoff. Hey Vince. Uh big picture perspective with this and all the news surrounding this in the last couple of months what do you think the ncaa is going to look like maybe 10 years down the road that's a great question um you know it's and it's hard to visualize andrew because if you take judge kavanaugh's uh, words to heart about you know the ncaa continuing to bring things back or not solving their own problems they were pretty terse pretty harsh words towards the NCAA to basically get things in order and stay out of the courtroom. And I think that does put, in my mind, incrementally more pressure on the NCAA to devise a better long-term plan and communicate that. Um, the challenge is you have very disparate views now from what you see in the Power Five versus the non-Power Five inside Division One. It's clear the economics have changed dramatically between the two uh, groups of universities. Uh, and will continue to based upon the the media rights and um, you know TV and money that's going on there, bowl games, even the CFP with what's coming uh, down the road. You know the economic gap between a power five and a non power five is significant. There's very few that have um, you know a, a revenue budget that would be approaching 100 million that would be outside the power five, and I think that's where. The even in you're seeing the struggle with name image and likeness between the power five and non power five, or if you want to call it the autonomy five, uh, to use the NCAA terms. It's I just think that's symbolic of the struggle to come as we go down the road and how they how the NCAA thinks about solving that in a long term strategy is going to be a, a real challenge for uh, for the Board of Governors, um, for Mark Emmert, the team. And it's a difficult one to just say, well, the, this we're set up this way because of the membership, or we only make decisions based upon the membership. It, that's that's a cop out, and I think it's it's uh, it's going to take some real gutsy decisions to figure out how to deal with this this growing scenario that uh, you're probably referencing, and what that might mean for the future of the NCAA. Our next question is for Ben Gumbel, and then Gary Graves, and then Cameron Teague. Hi, this is Ben Gumbel from CardinalSportsZone.com. Have you all had any discussions about the potential for any sort of group licensing agreements, whether that be with the NCAA, the ACC, or anyone else? Yeah, and you know, Matt, maybe you want to take this one, but I guess high level, I would say um, we have. We're 
you know, acutely aware of what it would look like if it were in play. It didn't seem to be the, the top of the agenda for the NCAA or others. Uh, there's varying views on it. Yet, say, even inside the conference or the Division One on whether group license should be out there or not. I think what you're seeing now is people looking at group licensing related to former student athletes as much as current current student athletes. But I'll let Matt speak to that one too. Yeah, you know, it's definitely a concept that's come up, and I know that the working group uh, that came up with at least the NCA proposals had had sort of vetted that. Um, there's been discussions around that as it relates to whether that means that athletes also have to unionize in order to do that, which is not necessarily the case. Um, but I can also tell you that we've had conversations um, with groups and companies that are out there that will be sort of that the, the middleman, if you will, of this process. And part of their transaction uh, opportunities that in in aligning with brands and athletes, essentially playing matchmaker, is maybe doing that by a position. So maybe they're going to get 20 quarterbacks who are in their platform to align with a particular brand, even though formal formally speaking, that may not be a group licensing. Functionally, it could be. Um, so we're we're aware of that. And then also, as as you know, Vince alluded to before, just how our own IP. And, and sort of group licensing uh, could work in terms of student athletes using uh, the Cardinal Birdhead logo, for example. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, Gary Graves from the AP. Um, Vince, I guess this has been developing for a while, and, and uh, what kind of um, feedback or input have you gotten from some of your student athletes in terms of how it might work for them and in terms of formulating the policy that you all have come up with? Yeah, I think that we've had a lot of feedback. Uh, you know, Matt and I have both been heavily engaged with our student athletes. And as uh, most are aware, you know, Celine Funky, who is our center fielder on the softball team, was uh, wrote a nice op-ed uh, on name, image, and likeness. I certainly had an opportunity to speak to her at, at length. She, she was president of the Student Athlete Advisory Committee on behalf of the ACC, not just the University of Louisville. So um, her input was awesome, as was our executive committee on the the SAC, as we call it. And, um, you know, so it has been brewing for a while. I think the, as you can imagine, the feedback is the concern that if, quote unquote, all the money goes to just a few or goes to just a few sports, what happens to the other sports and are we in danger? You know, Celine would say, does it put softball in danger, you know, based upon reading of her op-ed? And, and it's an interesting concept to certainly weigh out if do we think there would be enough corporate money diverted away from the athletic department to individuals where it may be problematic for the Olympic sports? Um, you know, I, I don't think that's the case at the University of Louisville, but um, I could see where that comes into question. But that's the biggest thing, Gary, that we talk about is their concern about, you know, corporate money leaving the athletic department's budget and moving elsewhere to where we have to, you know, have to cut back, if you will, our support. And, you know, we'll we'll certainly work hard against that, and would not expect that to happen at level. That's that's probably the biggest thing, Matt. You can touch on other things there. Yeah, it, that's a great question too, because every student athlete's coming from a different place, and 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 we've been consulting. I'll give you a real world example. One of our student athletes who is looking at pursuing business, creating her own business, and some opportunities there. She's also an international student athlete. And now you're taking into account her visa status of trying to create employment opportunity while here in the States. So when I say there's student athlete well-being issues beyond the financial opportunities that are, are in front of our athletes, there are also other implications, including for international students, you know, what that impacts their status. So it, kind of tying back, that's why we created an advisory board, which will include folks like Thomas Beard from our international center to help run point to give the best guidance we can to those athletes with those questions. But at the same time, in another conversation, we're talking with a student athlete and their parents about some of the opportunities they're looking at, which are driven by their social media following. And, and so the opportunities come in different shapes and sizes and also the, the sort of uh, tangential issues that we really want our athletes to be able to spot, issue spotting. You know, they may never have heard of a 1099 form. Well, they might get one now because they're earning income uh, doing this. So really getting them to kind of broaden their horizons on, on the transactional details of NIL. And I think to that point, you know, Eric 
mentioned earlier, you know, car dealerships. And I think because he's older like me, we think car dealerships, but the younger ones uh, think social media. You know, they think about Instagram posts and followings and being able to, you know, get a product that they can market and has a discount code. And that discount code is when it's used, triggers a commission for them. And they're they're pretty thoughtful about where their opportunities may lie that that somebody my age is not, you know, I certainly got kids in that age range who have provided nice guidance, but uh, the student athletes are pretty aware of their opportunities. We'll take five more questions. We've got Cam, Kent Taylor, uh, Matt McGavick, Pat Jaggers, and then Tim Sullivan. Yeah, Matt, actually real quick, I wanted to uh, follow up on something, something you, you noted. Is there a way, I know you can't really protect all student athletes from a company that may have ill intentions, but is there a way that like, I don't know, like you, if they disclose a contract, do you guys vet these companies or do they have to do that on their own? Yeah, Cam, that's a great question. And actually get, getting back to the disclosure piece, we have to really walk a fine line there be, for, for two couple of reasons. One is which the NCAA may put out that, you know, there's only so much institutional assistance we can in, in helping them. That has more to do with getting the deals versus helping guiding them manage the deals. And so we, we will be in a place to actually help vet, you know, whether it's looking at a contract through our law clinic or looking at, hey, I'm thinking about hiring one of these marketing agents and I don't any thoughts on this. You know, we can give them feedback at the end of the day. We, you know, it's going to be their decision. And that's not something we're sharing consistently. U of L isn't a party, as you know, to any of these transactions. It's going to be the student athlete and whoever that third party is. Um, but we're, we're going to be certainly trying to vet, including, you know, hey, you know, situations as best we can uh, where bad actors may lie. But that's where, we're, again, the life skills training is going to be huge. And, and, and earlier you had asked about disclosures. The reality is, too, some of these opportunities could happen in real time. So we're aware that something, especially social media, as Vince talked about, there could be an opportunity that comes to someone, they look at their phone, and within a minute, they've just earned $100. Their awareness that they need to report that is critical. We're, we're recognizing and being realistic that some of those are going to come on the back end. Um, but, you know, it, it is going to be central to this whole process to disclose. It's not trying to be a gotcha moment. We're trying to help protect and be transparent um, and, and fulfill our obligations, too. But, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of guidance in, in sort of direction in terms of, hey, you might want to think about this or think about that when looking at these parties, you know, how they're representing you. Do you understand a commission? Um, all, all of it. What services are they providing you? Are they taking certain rights of yours in perpetuity you know there are some big ramifications to some th things that they may be looking at um and so we're going to again do the best we can to educate them but not go too far th that the the rules of the game are being set for us and a, a quick follow to that you mentioned agents or marketing agent if a player doesn't want to sign an agent are they do they, is there a specific list they have to go through or if they want to just have their parents handle a lot of their business work is that is that possible yeah, that, that would be fine and permissible. And, and I can think of athletes in, in, in here at U of L where their parents will be very involved. They're pretty astute on the business side of what's out there. Um, with that said, I've even told the parents, like, you don't know necessarily your blind spots. Eventually, you may need to hire a tax consultant or a marketing or brand manager, whatever it might be. But they, they don't have to hire an agent. And, and, you know, the agent monitoring piece is the expectation they're registering with the state of Kentucky, that they're only getting involved on the NIL side, um, you know, in terms of principal guideposts to what what a permissible agent can do for the athletes. Can <clears throat> one, Sorry, one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, just a little clarity. An example of that may be like to, to some of what Matt's talking about. First, we can't tell them do or don't, you know, what to do, what not to do on the companies. Right. The second thing is on the, you know, companies like Cameo, right, that they can do happy birthday, you know, wishes to kids and things like that where they earn money. And, and there's coaches out there earning, you know, $10,000 plus or whatever, doing these birthday wishes or happy anniversary and things like that. You know, we want to make sure that they understand the reporting aspect. Do they get a statement from Cameo? You know, we've had to learn about all these other services so that they can track the dollars because, you know, these are kids that are going to leave their baseball glove at home before they go to the College World Series or they leave whatever, you know. The, their cleats or their their helmet 
So we got we got to help them as best we can as to, you know, what how can they track the financial aspect of what's happening and and turn that in as well. Go ahead, Kent. Yeah, events. Can you expand on your comments earlier about maybe some of the inherent advantages that you may have, or, or you in Kentucky, maybe in this state where you guys are so big and you don't have to compete with the professional sports dollars to where your athletes might be on more of a pedestal than say even athletes may be playing for a school in even New York City or Chicago? Well, I just think that our brand is prevalent in the in this town um, from the point you land at the airport to billboards and what people wear in this city. And, um, you know, we call it Provale um, because Louisville feels more like a pro sports. Our venues are more like pro sports, certainly the UM Center and our, our football stadium. And, um, you know, it, it does feel like more of a uh, a pro um, atmosphere. And I think that the way our contracts are and things we do with Learfield and others and the way we look at, um, you know, treating our, our fans and our donors is more like, a, you know, frankly, more like a pro environment. And there's that engagement that you see, you know, there's there's not many large companies uh, in the city that are they're not represented somewhere in advertising around our venues. Uh, that assist and we just you know it's a law of large <clears throat> excuse me the law of large numbers you know you're in a you're going to be in a bigger city <clears throat> you're going to have more opportunities with more companies and uh, you know in this instance we hope that that works to our advantage go ahead Matt Hey Vince, Matt McGavick with Sports Illustrated. Uh, obviously, you want student athletes to operate with common sense when going over potential NIL opportunities. But outside of business conflicts of interests or blatant NCAA violations, are there any uh, NIL opportunities that you do not want student athletes possibly pursuing? You know, I I think that um, once we get into these, man, it's a you know. Um, you know, to your point, I want them to use common sense all the time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think in this instance, the ones that, you know, we look at internally related to the University of Louisville and our own values, as I mentioned, it may be something that, you know, do we want student athletes to be representing CBD oil? Or do we want them to be representing something else, you know, that may be on the horizon that may or may not infringe upon the university's values? So I think that that's something that that's the one where, you know, we got to be careful as you get into these these spaces that the kids may say, well, hold on, marijuana is legal in Colorado. Why can't I represent it here? I live in Colorado. You know, I want to represent it in Colorado, but it doesn't represent the university. Those type of things. Don't think that those aren't going to come up. They are. Anything that we can't think of today, I'm sure we're going to see in terms of them thinking about how to take advantage of the opportunity. So I guess my, my high level question is we want to see more detail from what comes to the, the final um, probably from the federal as much as what the NCAA throws out. But then I think the first thought is just let's not get in conflict with the university's values. Next question to Pat Jaggers and then Tim Sullivan will close it out. Vince, when it comes to getting name, image, and likeness done in the state of Kentucky, I know uh, Governor Bashir released a, a statement yesterday and it had different quotes from different coaches and athletic officials from throughout the state. Can you just tell us about the conversations behind the scenes between maybe you and Mitch Barnhart and the other athletic directors and athletic leaders, like what, what that was like behind the scenes, you know, and, and secondly, was there any, you know, conflicts or hurdles you guys collectively, maybe when it comes to getting, you know, uh, the governor on board or the state, like, were there any issues you guys faced that were major hurdles in terms of getting this done and getting this rolling? Well, I think, you know, I'll start from the, the back and uh, last comment and move forward. But I think that as it relates to hurdles uh, that we may have faced, I mean, I think the fact that we didn't have anything in place was a big hurdle, uh, that it took an executive order and not, you know, running it through normal session as it as was, you know, it took a heroic act to some degree to, to get this through. You know, nobody likes to push through executive orders, particularly when you're looking at something um, some may have different views on, is this worth doing this on behalf of college student athletes? But so that's a hurdle in itself, just politically, I'm sure it was, uh, for the governor consider whether to, to do this or not. I would tell you that he was supportive, wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. I know that, uh, my conversations with, uh, 
with Andy were about, yeah, here's why I think it's right. Explain the situation. Um, you know, why we sh what would be the benefit? What would be the downfall? What would be the time frame? What's the, you know, the alternative? What if it didn't happen for 90 days? What if it happened for 30? We weighed out a lot of different scenarios, but I think it became clear to him that the timing was now and to not, not let this opportunity pass. And I think in terms of how to, you know, get the language right in his executive order, you know, it was back and forth. You know, we we talked to him and once you educate, um, you know, certainly educate him, his notes, you know, got reflected in what I thought was a well-crafted executive order. And um, and then on the, the flip side of that with Mitch, uh, Mitch and I talk pretty routinely. We've talked about name, image, and likeness going back probably a year. We touch base routinely, uh, but this week certainly talked more about it, knowing that the potential of this executive order could be coming and what uh, what it might look like for uh, for the state, for us, as well as the other schools in the state. And we kind of talked about that. Um, I think we were aligned. I don't think there was any selfish interest from either side that uh, when we got through this, I think we both felt like uh, it was important. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed the conversation. I've enjoyed the ones we've had on name, image, and likeness along the way. And now it's up to us competitively to come up with our own guidelines. You know, Mitch has got to do what's best for the University of Kentucky at this point. And I've got to do what's best for the University of Louisville. So from that, we understand the competitive side of it, but we needed a baseline to work from. And um, it was, it was like I said, very collaborative, uh, both between the universities and then uh, certainly involving uh, Governor Bashir. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, this is for both uh, Vince and Matt. Uh, obviously, you've devoted a lot of uh, resources and thought to this initiative and the various initiatives that you've uh, revealed. Um, I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a timeline for when that process started and also what in your mind was the tactical uh, importance of, of being ahead of the curve on this issue. Uh, it clearly has recruiting ripples and competitive uh, balance uh, concerns. Uh, and I'd be interested in how your thoughts evolved on this and how you started to uh, to uh, craft action. Yeah, that's uh, the the timeline's hard to recall, Tim. I've, I've another I was on the ACC name image likeness subcommittee, which goes back. I don't even know if it's two years, maybe it's 18 months. Um, but at that time, we were talking about right here on our campus. What are we going to do? And as, and as Matt mentioned, it took a long time. We had to develop plans with our law school, with our sports administration, sports administration program, the business school, you know, bringing in our subject matter experts on campus. So, you know, I'd say 18 months. Uh, Matt can answer this too to see if he has a different time frame that I can recall, like factually recall this, like starting to talk about in meetings having separate meetings on name, image, and likeness, and then engaging with other other parties. And then I was fortunate to be behind the scenes on some of this with what was happening at the NCAA, NCAA level and obviously in the conference. Um, so timeline, that's my best guess and how we started on our strategy and some of the tactics that you referenced. You know, the, what's the genesis for this and what we've invested? It's the student athlete experience. It's what drives us every day. Um, you know, I'm. I'm big on it. We try to do all we can to uh, invest around it. Um, I feel like we do more than most. I'm prideful about that. Um, that's why I said when the Alston case ruling came down, I felt like we were a good portion of the way there already because of what we're doing on top of uh, what's required and felt like this was another one where we could show our student athletes current and perspective that Louisville is progressive and uh, is going to go all out for their their student athlete experience. We have one more uh, pet checkers with a quick follow up. Go ahead, Pat, real quick. Uh, Vince, and this might be more of a question for Matt, but uh, just out of curiosity, this might be a little premature, but was just wondering if maybe if any student athletes had come to you already with a request about a business or some type of inquiry in the last twenty four hours. Um, yeah. Yes, in the last 24 hours, not specifically, but we've been talking to athletes even before the last 24 hours about opportunities they're thinking about. Um, you know, we know athletes have, have signed up with third party companies to then launch, you know, July 1st. So a lot of this has been in the works behind the scenes, but 
Uh, we've got more conversations and, and education coming up. Uh, we've been talking to our coaching staffs, including this week. Uh, earlier this week, we met with our entire volleyball team. You know, and that, that's another thing. Our Olympic sport athletes, our female athletes, there are going to be some opportunities here across the board. Um, and, and so the, the questions are going to continue to come. We've set up a dedicated email. Um, we're doing one-on-one -on -one consultations. So I I anywhere and anyhow we can provide that, that help, um, we're going to do it. And, and thank you. Be, just to be more clear, Matt or I have no NIL opportunities yet. So if you know of any, you can send them our way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I did want to go maybe just one other closing thought to Tim's question before. You know, it, we've had high profile athletes, as you all know, for years. So the, the NIL issue isn't new to us because the law might have been changing. You know, you think about opportunities Lamar Jackson or Katie George or others could have had behind the scenes. We've been navigating these things for many, many years, um, you know, obviously with a different set of rules. And so um, th those are things, and I go back to my position prior to being at UofL. I was at the, the Ohio Valley Conference and we had a, a student athlete at Belmont with music aspirations. And we there were some restrictions placed on that young, young man who happened to play baseball. So th these are sort of uh, nuances and, and issues behind the scenes we've been navigating for years. And, and like Vince said from the start, we, we think that it's a great opportunity and glad the change is on the horizon. All right, guys, I appreciate everyone's time. We went about, what, 50, about 45 minutes, so. Went pretty in-depth, though. Interesting.